Hello, family and friends. Welcome to day 54 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. Now, before we start, I want to ask you a question. Where do you feel like you are in your life? What season are you in? Are you in a season of anticipation or maybe waiting on God? Are you in the beginning of a journey with Him? Or how about right in the middle, right in the thick of it all, in the wilderness, maybe in the desert? Or are you in a battle? coming out of a battle or are you singing victory because you just won a battle now we ask this question in our facebook group and i hope that you are part of that community you can find the info below but i believe that when we have answers like this and we walk with each other through life we will know and be encouraged that god is with us in every season no matter what now today we are beginning the book of Numbers, and I know that you guys are probably familiar with this book, and if you are, you might be squirming in your seat a little bit, because there's a lot of names in this book. It's probably one that you have skipped over in the past. But let's take on the heart of God as we read through this book over the next two weeks. Because remember, every person matters. Every detail counts. And if the book of Exodus covered one entire year and the book of Leviticus covered just one month, Imagine how much we're going to unpack in this book that covers a span of 38 years. This census or numbering of God's people is like the final roll call before battle. There's tension, there's restlessness, but there's also a lot of anticipation for what God is about to do, and I feel it. This is the desert season. This is the wilderness season for the Israelites, the period right before they enter into the biggest blessing of their lives, the promised land. But because of their faithlessness, what should have only taken them 11 days is going to take them 40 years of going round and round and round. So as we read through this book of murmurings or this time in the wilderness, take heart because we will see victory. We will see God. But as always, before we begin, let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are holy and we worship and honor you for your goodness, for who you are. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, you are sovereign. You know what is happening. You are in control of it all. And we submit ourselves before you today. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lord, we take of your bread today. We eat of the manna that you are providing. We thank you for your word today and what you are going to speak. Every word is so significant and we are honored to be students of it. We are honored to come into your presence and to know that you are with us. I pray your Holy Spirit will speak today. Breathe upon our hearts, O oh God. Forgive us, Lord, for anything that we've done wrong. Reveal to us, Lord, if we do not know the things that we have done that may have caused us to go astray. Anything that may have been dishonoring to you. Help us to forgive people who have hurt us, Lord, so that we can break the chains and the bondage that is holding us captive. Help us to release those people to you, to surrender them over to you, Lord, for we know that that is where true freedom will happen, is when we let go of that control. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We pray for your protection against the wiles of the enemy, Lord, and we pray, God, that you will protect us, that you will keep us safe, that you will not allow the enemy to have his way in our hearts today. He has no place here, not in this place, not in our families, not in our homes, not in our marriages, not in our well-being. For you are our protector. You are our God. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Numbers is the fourth book of the Torah or the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible. Can you, can you believe that? We have gotten through four books already. The first three plus Job. And now we're here in Numbers. Now, this was actually called In the Wilderness. This was not called Numbers. We call it Numbers in our English translation uh, of our Bibles, but it was actually called In the Wilderness. So we're here about 13 months after they have left Egypt, and they're about to take a census of the people. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses. This is mentioned 150 times. So this is setting the tone for this book. That God is using Moses to speak to the people, that he will never stop speaking to them, no matter what, no matter how much they complain, no matter how much they disobey, the Lord will continue to speak to them in the wilderness of all places, of Sinai, in the tent of meeting. This is amazing. God will speak to us not only in our wilderness seasons, but also in the tent of meeting. And I believe that a lot of the times God will speak to you right in church. I mean, I don't know if you have ever experienced being in church and being like, did somebody tell the pastor that I was coming today? Because I swear he's talking just to me. So the Lord does speak 
through church. And now I know we had this discussion about, you know, going to church and finding a church. And there's some people who say, I just can't do it. I've got trauma or I, I don't have the ability to go to church or I'm too scared to go to church. The biggest thing is that you're within the fellowship of believers. And one of those fellowships are right here. You know, the church today is actually not within four walls. The church is believers. It is us. It's me and you. And so the fact that you're here in this fellowship, take heart. That is an amazing thing. I was not condemning anybody for not being in an actual brick and mortar church. So just know that. But I was encouraging it because I was saying there are things that happen in the brick and mortar churches that don't always happen inside a fellowship of believers within homes or at coffee shops or whatever. So God will speak to you regardless, though, as long as you are seeking him, drawing near to him. Uh, Also in the wilderness, this is speaking of both. He speaks to them physically through Moses, but also spiritually. And this is happening on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. So this is happening. Let me take a look here. I I printed this out and I actually put this in the notes today, this calendar. So we're here in the month of, this is the first month. This is around March and April, right? This is that first month where they left Egypt or Abib, also known as Abib. This first census is going to take place somewhere between the Passover and Pentecost. We know this. So this is generally the feast of weeks this is a time of harvest or general harvest so this is somewhere in the middle of april is what we're looking at on the jewish calendar after the first year of them leaving so we're one year in okay (laughs) just want to get you guys on the same page of where we're at on the timeline uh he was saying to them take census of all the congregation of the israel by clans by fathers houses according to the number of names every male head by head So this is God saying, I need you to number my people. I need you to make a military roster. You guys are getting ready to go into the promised land. There's a lot of Canaanites there. We're going to have to fight. No matter what, he's going to bring the victory, but they still have to fight. They still have to battle just the way we do. So he's like, I need you to take numbers. Make sure you take inventory. Who all is here? Who are your men? What are your weapons? All the things. This is God's harvest of his people. Verse three, from 20 years old and upward. So this is, these are the people they are going to count. 20 year old males, all in Israel who are able to go to war, you and Aaron shall list them company by company. And there shall be with you a man from each tribe, each man being the head of the house of his fathers. So we're going to see the 12 tribes and we're going to see the chosen men who act almost like governors or the leaders of these tribes, right? Good luck, Kanoi. Verse five, and these are the names of the men who shall assist you. From Reuben, Elizer, the son of Shedir. From Simeon, Shalumiel, the son of Zerishadai. From Judah, Nashon, the son of Aminadab. From Issachar, Nathanael, the son of Zuar. From Zebulun, Eliab, the son of Helon. From the sons of Joseph. From Ephraim, Elishama, the son of Imihud, and from Manasseh, Gamaliel, the son of Padazer, from Benjamin, Abidan, the son of Gideoni, from Dan, Ahizer, the son of Amishadai, from Asher, Pegiel, the son of Okran, from Gad, Eliasaph, the son of Dul, from Naphtali, I have said that wrong the whole time, now I know it's Naphtali, Ahira, the son of Enan, these were the ones chosen. So the people basically elected them or they were chosen from the congregation, the chiefs of their ancestral tribes, the heads of the clans of Israel. Now, let's take a look at these names here and the meanings behind them, because it is pretty significant. If we take a look at what uh, scholars believe that these names meant. So Elizer meant my God is a rock. Uh, Shalumiel meant my peace is God. Nashon, my people are noble. Issachar. Gift of God. Oh, sorry. Nathanael, gift of God. I got that switched around. Eliab, my God is father. Uh, Elishama, Elishama, my God hears. Gamaliel, reward of God. Abidin, my father is judge. Uh, Ahiezer, my brother is a helper. Pegiel, met by God. Eliasaph, God has added. And Ahira, my brother is evil. That one took me <laughs> took me for a loop there but most of them if you notice they have l in them and they refer to god 
Can you see that? L, 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 uh, L, L. So many of them make reference to God, but this is a snapshot of the position of all of the tribes of Israel. So Moses and Aaron took these men who had been named, and on the first day of the second month, they assembled the whole congregation together who registered themselves by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names from 20 years old and upward, head by head, as the Lord commanded Moses. So he listed them in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, ancestry was carefully kept during this time. This was how they knew who your ancestors were, what tribe you belonged to, whether or not you were an Israelite. This is the way you would know. And they continued to keep this through, throughout the generations. So this is where we're going to see each clan that is listed and the number of people within each clan. Now, I'm not going to read all of this because it's the same thing over and over and over and over, but we will look at a snapshot of this in just a moment. So God here is basically creating his armies. He wants to do this because we are never meant to go into battle alone. He wants us to have people surrounding us. This is why, again, it is so important to be within fellowship with other believers so that you aren't going at it alone. You don't have to fight alone. You have people praying with you and for you, laying hands on you, encouraging you. Now, even though... This is the first generation of men counted. They're actually not going to enter the promised land. We see uh, this first generation, the old generation, all numbered from chapters 1 through 12 of the book of Numbers. So it's kind of sad, but regardless of the fact that these guys will not enter into the promised land, it never alters God's purpose or his plan. All right, so we're going to skip down to verse 32 for now. Of the people of Joseph, namely, of the people of Ephraim, their generations by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names from 20 years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Ephraim were 40,500. The reason why I highlighted this is because this was an exception to how this was all spoken. They would say these are the people, who they are, the generations by their clans, according to the names, head by head. I mean, all of that was repeated. This was the only one that made note that these two were the sons of Joseph. So Levites were not included in the census because Levites belonged to God. They had a holy job to take care of the tabernacle, to be the priests, to basically be the, the homekeepers, right? They were kind of like, I don't know what we'd call them, like the National Guard, <laughs> if you wanted to kind of compare it in a worldly sense. They were the ones who were at home, who were caring for uh, the people. So that didn't take away from the fact that there were still 12 listed here. So because the Levites were not listed, God actually gave Joseph a double share. Joseph's sons were adopted as Jacob's own sons. So this is why he names the two sons in this clan. So they get a double share because each of those boys, those two sons of Joseph, they each get the same share as their uncles. I hope that makes sense. All right. So with all of this, Every man able to go to war, all those listed were 603,550. That's a lot of men. So you figure you count their wives and maybe four children or so. The total population was anywhere between two and I've seen all the way up to five million. I wrote here two to three. I've seen two to 2.5, but I have seen two to five million. We don't really know. Um, we're just taking a guess based on what the general family size was at the time. So this census is verifying God's promise to Abraham. It is identifying every single person. God knows us by name. He still does that today. He knows our hairs on our head. He knows the, you know, the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore. This separated God's people from the rest of the world. And then this organized his army. So here we're looking at the Levites being exempted from this. But the Levites were not listed among them, along with them by their ancestral tribe. For the Lord spoke to Moses saying, only the tribe of Levi you shall not list and you shall not take a census of them among the people of Israel. But appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all its furnishings and over all that belongs to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings and they shall take care of it and shall camp around the tabernacle. So they will be the ones closest to the glory of God. They will be the ones closest camped out near the tabernacle, near the Shabbat, the glory of God. And this, if you think about it, 
we crave the glory of God in our lives. We think we want more money. We think we want, um, you know, a bigger house. We want a nicer car, but it's actually the glory of God that we crave. We're never going to be satisfied by all of those things. So without it, without the glory of God, we truly will never be content. So you want to camp yourself (laughs) next to the glory of God so that you know that you will be fulfilled at all times. When the tabernacle is to set out, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And if any outsider comes near, this not meaning a foreigner, this means a non-Levite. So if anybody else within these tribes or anyone else for that matter outside of the tribes comes near, they shall be put to death. This is huge because God is establishing once again, my tabernacle is a holy place and the only people to carry it are the Levites. And they do so in a very specific way, carrying by poles, right? All of the different furnishings. So this is to show you, we need to keep God's place and keep God as holy. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies, each man in his own camp, each man by his own standard. So we will see down here by his own standard, there's likely to be banners or flags or maybe even by color. Because remember on the breastplate of the high priest, each tribe gets their own color of a jewel. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. Thus did the people of Israel. They did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. Now we may not be going into a physical battle, but every single day I feel like God is constantly preparing us for the battle that might be ahead. Because the Bible says that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age. So we will always be facing some sort of battle. So we too need to take inventory because just like the Israelites, God will fight for us. He will bring victory for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Anything that is meant for evil, God will turn it for good. But we still need to make sure that we are battle ready. So what are some things that we can look at within our own lives? We need to take inventory of some of the tools that God has put into our tool belt. What are our gifts? What are the things that we can use in the times of battle? What are your spiritual gifts? Do you know what those are? Are you equipped to be an intercessor, to be a person of prayer? Are you equipped to discern good from evil? Are you equipped to have the faith that no matter what, God is with you? It's so important to know the tools that you have, the weapons that you've got at the ready. We can take inventory of some of the lessons that we've learned or some of the things that God has done in our past, how he has come through for us time and time again, because that is going to strengthen your faith that in those hard times, you can remember how he came through for you before and know and trust that he will come through for you once again. If you are still standing here today, if you are watching this video, then God has brought you through some things and he will do it again. Take inventory of your army. Who are your people? Do you have a tribe? Do you have people on your right and on your left? And are you that for someone as well? Are you on the right or on the left side of other people? Are you helping to raise up others' arms whenever they feel weary? And then take inventory of your destination. Do you know where you're going? Do you have a vision? Have you mapped it out? What is there? Are there resources there? Is the enemy there? What are the challenges that you're going to have to face? These are things that we can do and apply to our lives from the census that God intended for the people of Israel to take inventory so that we are battle ready. Now in chapter two, God is going to arrange the camp. He places each of the tribes in a very specific place around his tabernacle. Because as always, God is a God of order. He designs things perfectly. So the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, the people of Israel shall camp each by his own standard with the banners of their father's houses. They shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. So again, I am not going to read through this because it all uh, basically lists the tribes again, how many people, where they're camping and who camps with them. So what I did do though, is I put these things in my notes. You can find the link below in the description box because I'm a visual learner and I feel like this is easier for me to understand rather than reading a bunch of words. So 
I did add a couple of notes here, but if you do print out or if you look at the notes below, you will see here that this is the way that God had them camped out. So on the east side, he had the camp of Judah, which included Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. They were going to be the first who would set out. Every time that they picked up and left, the camp of Judah would go first. And they were the ones camped out in the east, the place where the sun rises. So they had a pride of place. They were able to look every day to the promise of a new day, to the power of God raising up the sun on a new day. So they were the ones who were like, let's go. They were going to lead the camp. Then in the south, we have Gad, Simeon, and Reuben camping under Reuben. They would be the second to set out in the camp. And then God would send out the tabernacle with the Levites next. So first, second, tabernacle in the middle, because one, they wanted to protect the tabernacle, but also this is a symbol that God is at the center of our camp. Then we have the camp of Ephraim. We have uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. So these are the two sons of Joseph. And they would go out third after the tabernacle. And then on the north side, this would be the camp of Dan. We have Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Naphtali. <laughs> keep saying that wrong and they would go out last so this is a picture of what we will see as God's camp and take a look at this of course it is spelled out in the picture of the cross so here in verse 34 wrapping this up thus did the people of Israel according to all that the Lord commanded Moses so they camped by their standards and so they set out each one in his clan according to his father's house I don't know about you but I am nerding out over here I am loving already what God is establishing here as he numbers his people, as he takes inventory, as he readies them for battle. I'm getting excited. And he is calling each and every one of us and say, present. I am present. I am ready. I am ready to rock. You called my name. I hear you. Suit me up. Put me in coach. Let's go. And we're doing this together. We are an army. We are gathering together, equipping each other for the battles ahead. And I am so excited. We are only a month and a half in and look how far we've come already. Look at what God is doing. Can you imagine where we will be at the end of this year? Things that we will go through together, the lessons that we'll learn. I hope you stick with us. And if you go astray, come back. Know that we are here. We are waiting. We're not going anywhere. So make sure that you are connected in our Facebook group because it is there where we are finding true community. We, we are linking arms and we are gathering together. We're praying for one another. We're helping each other. We're bringing extra resources, bringing words of wisdom. It is amazing. So get connected in there. Now, if you feel like you're sitting on the outside looking in and you're saying, I don't know what this whole Christianity thing is about, I want to give you the opportunity now to become part of the family of God. And the way that you do that is by hearing the invitation and believing in your heart that God sent his one and only son to come and die for the sins of the world. He died and he rose again. And all you have to do is confess it with your mouth once you believe that and you will be saved. You will receive eternal life. There's only two choices. When we die, we're going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell and it's for eternity and we don't get a second chance. So don't let this pass you by. Say this prayer with us. Believe in your heart that it's true and you will receive eternal life. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying for me. I believe that you did so and that you rose again. I open my life to you to come and dwell, to have your way, to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I welcome you, Holy Spirit, to dwell in my heart and to lead me each and every day. I thank you that you're with me and that you'll never leave me and you'll never forsake me. And I declare that this is the day of my salvation. I love you and praise you and honor you in the name of Jesus, I pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you, God, that you're preparing us, that you continue to grow our faith, our knowledge, our wisdom, and we invite you to keep doing that, Lord. Help us to rise up as leaders. Help us to be the ones who are chosen, Lord, the ones who are leading people into battle. Help us to disciple each other. Help us to raise up others, Lord, who will do the same. This isn't about just a bunch of consumption, a bunch of knowledge, Lord. This is a journey where you want to equip us so that we can equip others. So I pray, God, that you will do that in your people today. 
Thank you for this space that feels so safe to be able to come as we are. No matter what we've been through, no matter what we're going through, and no matter where we're going. Lord, we are one army. We are one family. We thank you that you, Holy Spirit, are guiding us in this time. So I pray, Lord, that we will not grow fat with all of this knowledge, Lord, but that we will do something with it and we will pour it out onto others. We love you so much. We honor you in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.